You're not even listening to me. Casual a joke as this may seem, if taken literally, it's one of the oddest uses of the second person pronoun in pop music. Rivaled only by Carly Simon's more blatant stunt, you probably think this song is about you. What both this and the Carly Simon lyric accomplish is the instantaneous division of you from the song's actual listener. If you're hearing these words, they don't apply to you. Whereas drivers who don't tailgate never see the words, if you can read this bumper sticker, you're too close. In both cases, the partition of you the subject from you the hearer enlists you the hearer on the side of the singer's criticism. How dare you be so vain as to not even listen to this song about you, you, you dirty rotten whoever you are. In traditional accounts, that's to say in Bob Dylan's accounts, when a singer sings you, he often means me, much as in dreams where the dreamer's persona is projected onto another. Could mind be a self-addressed stamped envelope? More particularly, is the singer addressing his own deafened mind? If we suppose that you and I in the song were trapped in the same skull, it would at least explain the singer's investment in this hopeless effort. I need something to change you, mind. The repetitions and the mounting derangement make this perhaps another portrait of a psycho killer standing before an occluded mirror. You talking to me? I don't see anyone else here. Yet with, what, yet with what would he address his mind if not his mind? The answer appears. It comes directly from my heart to you. The entry of this other phantasmal body part, the human heart personified as a seat of emotion rather than the blood pumping workhorse of anatomy, is so unexpectedly corn pone that we may experience it as sardonic. Winning hearts and minds, you may recall, is a military goal. But here, one heart claims access to another while damnable mind goes on huddling in its lead-lined bunker. Just after the three-minute mark, relief of a sort comes in the form of a guitar part, one expulsive and obtrusive enough to dismantle, if not resolve, the song's dilemma. The player rudely howls a pair of long bent notes, then scratches convulsively to fill the measure before he can howl again. The result is jeering and spastic, disdainful yet complicit. Whether anything could improve on this guitar's commentary is unlikely. The song never recovers its mind. Since it never had one in the first place, we feel great. <laughs> 